This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, William Nyberg is an ANS associate member and numismatic researcher who has written articles for the John Reich Journal and Pennywise on topics such as dye studies and research on early engravers. He is uh, the author of Robert Scott, Engraving Liberty, which is a comprehensive biography on the engraver published in 2015. William Nyberg has an MBA from Seattle University and is uh, retired from Boeing after a 36 year long career uh, with the last five as an associate technical fellow for industrial engineering. Today, Bill will be presenting uh, a really intriguing topic, influence on enlightenment publications uh, on technology and design at the first United States Mint. So please welcome William Nyberg. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and it's an honor to be here, and I welcome everyone to the presentation. Uh, let me get into it and share my screen here. And I'll go into presentation mode. So everything looks good? Perfect. So, um, in my research on Robert Scott, uh, I uncovered a number of publications that were uh, printed and published in the United States in Philadelphia uh, just prior to the Mint. And since that time, since my book has been out, I've been doing additional research and uh, uncovered some more very interesting things uh, pertaining to both production, uh, technology, and design, uh, neoclassical design. So I will go ahead and launch into it here. Um, some of these I'll go through kind of quickly. The primary sources are uh, encyclopedias, other contemporary publications, artifacts, coin seals, dyes, federal reference stamps, copper plate engravings, uh, national archives, uh, US Mint records, and also I have a patent to show and uh, manuscript collections, business records, letters. Uh, just a couple of uh, selected secondary sources. Uh, the first one is about Dobson's Encyclopedia, and that was published in 1991. Prior to that, that was almost uh, lost in time. There's very little known about it, and uh, there's not too many sets that are uh, exist anymore. Uh, I did manage to get a, a partial set that contains about 90% of what Robert Scott did. Um, the second one is about French Encyclopedia, Enlightening the World, Encyclopedia, the book that changed the course of history. And the third one is uh, Richard Shearer. I collaborated with him uh, prior to public publishing my book, uh, The Enlightenment Book, Scottish Authors uh, and Publishers in 18th Century Britain, Ireland, and America. Uh, the United States Mint progressed from small beginnings in 1792 to 10 denominations of quality coinage in 1796. And uh, that was everything that was specified by the Coinage Act at that time. Uh, that would include milled coinage machines struck by the uh, screw press, uh, lettered and reeded edges right from the start, and the beautiful drape bust design. Um, European mints required centuries of development to achieve that level of excellence. Um, Director Boudinot said to Congress uh, basically the same thing. Uh, the mints in Europe have been gradual in their improvements, and then he made a very bold statement. Those lately executed are superior to any made uh, in the world. I've got a little margin there. I can't see the whole thing. Uh, so the big uh, question here is how do the knowledge transfer of technology and design occur? How do they quickly uh, go from uh, 1792 to the quality coinage of 1796, and even considering the state coinage and uh, contract coinage, uh, just a, a dramatic improvement. How do they do it? Take a look. Some of the sources, um, uh, of course, there's workers with mint experience, really only one, and that was Henry Voigt. And uh, that's a quote from his uh, application in his younger days, worked several years uh, at the Mint in Saxe-Gotha. 
He knows how to use every engine belonging to the Mint, um, but is also able to make one himself, everyone himself. Uh, Albion Cox uh, had uh, experience with New Jersey Coppers and also with his experience in England um, on a saying. And of course, uh, Mint Director David Rittenhouse had uh, experience with paper money. He was treasurer of Pennsylvania for uh, a number of years, and he had some engraving background. And and Henry Voigt also had a, a bit of a Henry or um, engraving background. Uh, teaching and mentoring, uh, Chief Engraver Robert Scott was uh, very well trained in engraving in all its branches and also uh, art history and some sculpture. Uh, but he was not trained in coinage dye engraving. Um, Adam Eckfeld, uh, he was a uh, titled dye forger and turner when he did uh, go to work full time for the mint, learned metal smithing and a lot of things from his father. And both those people were immediately uh, valuable to the mint and uh, right from the start. Uh, publications on mint processes, uh, books encyclopedia, which are known as codified descriptive knowledge, uh, including a saying. <laughs> Metallurgy, uh, die sinking, description of equipment, screw presses, edge lettering, rolling machines, along with classical design instruction and heraldry. And those are available in the United States prior to the Mint. Um, and there's kind of a long history of, of that. Um, this is a one page um, summary of the Enlightenment and the First Industrial revolution. Uh, the Age of Enlightenment, it's also known as the Age of Reason, occurred from 1685 to 1815, about. Uh, there were great advances in science, engineering, economics, philosophy, and so on, and all focused mainly on uh, the engineering for uh, mint technology and also for uh, design. Uh, knowledge was transferred and disseminated through illustrated encyclopedias, it was a European movement with uh, global influence, uh, especially the Americas. Um, the first industrial revolution was about 1750 to 1840, uh, manufacturing processes utilizing machines to increase production rates, iron works process improvements, steam power, uh, Britain, Europe, and the Americas, um, divergent knowledge transfer, and that is um, a knowledge transfer from a single source like an encyclopedia that is um, disseminated to thousands of people. And so that really accelerates the learning from just one on one mentoring and teaching to spreading it through publications. And uh, that accelerated the Industrial Revolution. This is an incredible. Um, illustration here. This is from the French Encyclopedia, 1762, uh, and it's a screw cutting factory. And uh, earlier than this, it would typically be a one person shop, but uh, the factories were forming uh, during, during the Industrial Revolution. And here you have um, a person operating a smaller lathe, cutting a screw, and this could be turned by hand. And it's a smaller one. There's a large one here. And you see this person has, uh, using the weight of his body uh, um, uh, through his leg muscles there to turn a larger screw. And that could be used potentially for, oops, for um, a screw press. And in the background, you see a forge and an anvil there. Uh, Matt is working. And they're using the the steam and the heat uh, rising from the forge to activate a reciprocating mechanism and linkage that goes back to that large flywheel. And so it's a, it's an amazing uh, illustration that kind of captures the, the spirit of the Industrial Revolution, I think. Um, this is a progression of encyclopedias through the Enlightenment, and I there's a, a lot more than this. There's a large German uh, one, uh, Zilder's uh, uh, a lexicon, and I'm going through that now. I didn't have enough to, for this presentation, but Henry Voigt may have been influenced by it. Uh, but these are the ones uh, in English, uh, French, and the United States. So encyclopedia. Uh, that was Efren Chambers, who published that in 1728. And uh, I'll include a couple of quotes here. 
uh, it includes a lot on coining and engraving. Uh, since the invention of milling money in France, it has been imitated by other nations, but none with a success equal to that of the English, who have carried it to the utmost perfection, both in the beauty of the graving, engraving, and by the invention of the impressions on the edges, uh, that admirable expedient for preventing the alteration of the species. And uh, I will mention uh, later that the mint started right, uh, right from the start in lettering edges on half dollars and dollars uh, to prevent the alteration of them. Um, and a lot of people uh, have speculated on, on how dyes are polished. And here is an excerpt. Uh, it's partly cut off for me, but when the matrix is finished, um, it is... Uh, polished with pumice stone, uh, cleaned with a hairbrush, and lastly, polished with oil and emery. And then it is fit to strike uh, coins, metals, and so on. There's a lot more on polishing. They use things like um, burnt straw for a very fine polish on that could be for a proof uh, finish, or uh, they use um, many other compounds that are uh, used for uh, polishing triply. I've used triply myself in polishing uh, sterling and also for metal. Um, second one is a big French encyclopedia. Um, that was really uh, started out to be a copy of the English and it, it, it grew and grew to 28 volumes, 20 million words. And you figure the typical book is 100,000, a large book is 100,000 words. There's a lot of books in those uh, 20 volumes, and this is the first one that really had a lot of illustrations of mechanical arts, as they called it, uh, including machinery and a lot of coining stuff. Um, so it went from uh, the French back to the, the British, and um, right after it was published, not surprisingly, is when the Britannica started. Uh, and it went quickly through three editions. It was nearly as large. Um, it, it does include a lot of things pertaining to uh, mints, geometry, heraldry, coining, engraving, classical design, metallurgy, and so on. And you could actually take that information. And if you had skilled people in that were uh, mechanically skilled engineering types, you could create a mint from the information that was in there. Um, that was essentially copied uh, into Dobson's Encyclopedia in Philadelphia. And they did this, uh, as soon as one was published, they would send it over to America. And about six months later, they would they would publish it. So it had the same information. It did have some American uh, Ill uh, edited and uh, illustrated articles. Robert Scott was a primary engraver and became the chief engraver of the United States Mint. Uh, he did by far the most of any engraver, 129 illustrations, uh, and with his assistants, uh, did about 234 uh, of the 550 total. Um, they sold a lot of sets of this. They sold 2,000 sets um, all throughout the United States, and it was based in Philadelphia, uh, Dobson's uh, Stone House, as they called it, um, was a gathering place for uh, people interested in books. And uh, it, it was very uh, popular. Not many sets uh, survived, though. Uh, natural philosophy, uh, uh, this is not really an encyclopedia, but it does uh, have a lot of information on mechanical engines, screws, and optics. And again, Robert Scott was an engraver for uh, the two different American printings. It was, it was also very popular. These are uh, my Will Warren and Will of natural philosophy of, and the encyclopedia. Um, the natural philosophy, I came from 1860, out of library 1860, the Brooklyn Library. Uh, just some of the content, um, axis in the wheel, pulley and tackle uh, of mechanical powers uh, of the screw and mechanical, mechanical engines in general. Um, all types of mechanical movement here. It, it describes and on the right, that's a title page of the encyclopedia, uh, one of the uh, 21 volumes. And this came out of a, a woman's prison uh, that was in for a number of years in the, in the 19th century in American Massachusetts. And uh, very interesting. 
so this leads into uh, screw technology for lead and machine screws. Ma machine screws are basically used to attach, um, to fasten things together into assemblies, and they use a finer pitch. Uh, it's technically a, a lead screw, but um, it uses a, a very fine pitch. A lead screw is used to generate movement from radial motion. And this is a Robert Scott and Gray. This is up to 88. Uh, this is kind of a notional example, but um, and you might wonder why why is a lever on the nut? Well, there, there are some uses for that, and which I'll get into. If it was a screw press, the lever would be on the top, so the screw would be the linear actuator. In this case, the nut is actually uh, providing movement. In this micrometer school screw, and uh, notice that the uh, the threads are really fine on this, and they did have that ability. Uh, prior to the mint, this is 1788, and I and all uh, and in the United States also. This is an example where uh, the nut is actually the actual actuator of the uh, measurement there, and the the screw is uh, stationary and just guides the the nut up and down. Um, David Wilkinson. Uh, he was an American machinist and some consider him to be the father of uh, uh, American machining. Uh, came up with a, a patent in 1780. Uh, that's for cutting screws and very ingenious. It utilizes a master screw with a sliding deck so they could replicate and cut exactly the same uh, threads as a master screw. So you could get a set of screws that would all match and um and this this was happening before that was 70 after the mint started but uh there they were leading into that uh, as far as replication um prior to that time so there's screw cutting and uh, ability in the united states um uh, that wouldn't, uh, standards wouldn't come until 1860. Um, and of course, the British and, and Americans were different in the their standards, uh, but they were working towards replication and the technology was increasing very quickly uh, during the Industrial Revolution. There was synchronized gear there that turn it. They could use a, utilize a water wheel if they wanted to. Uh, neat stuff. That leads into screw press technology, and uh, I need to say that screw presses were used in the United States, in the Americas, before the U.S. Mint, and they were used for uh, various metals, got the uh, the best 400-401, um, patterns of 1783, uh, coins, you have the Spanish mill dollar 1732 from and other places in uh, the Spanish uh, colonial empire that were using them in, in South America in the 18th century. Um, so the uh, technology was there, but in the U.S. it was not the size required for dollar coinage. And that would come uh, in 1795 by uh, Samuel Howell Jr. Uh, supplied one. He also supplied a half dollar press. So the dollar one, I think, was 3,232 uh, pounds um which took a lot of time a lot of effort it took many months to to get that um these were described in encyclopedias um uh, uh in the french encyclopedia in the britannica and this is from the britannica and it was copied uh nearly exactly uh, by robert scott and robert scott uh, took the the legends off the the dies, and I need to say also that uh, the dies used in the U.S. Mint were uh, cylindrical. Uh, Adam Eckfeld would would turn the 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 square corner, the square uh, stock down to a round shape, and in 1806 they actually had a frustum uh, shape that was slightly cone shaped at the top. Uh, because of the number of uh, chips or cuds that were being formed on the dies were failing very quickly on a lot of the coinage uh, uh, between 1800 and 1806. And after that, there were no cuds um, on the half dollars, 1807 onwards. So uh, uh, pretty uh, interesting here. Um, you've got a 90 degree throw that they had to en engineer with a 
pitch uh, and they just allowed about an inch here of clearance um, uh, that, that would allow for a, a feeding tube and some kind of type of ejection uh, mechanism. And I consider these to be conceptual uh, illustrations because they don't have all the details of them. And a person like Henry Voigt with an engineering mind could take this and you'd say, you know, this is a uh, forged plate and it's going to shake loose. The top is good. It's going to be held, held down with machine screws. It's going to shake loose. And uh, maybe a casting, maybe a U-shaped casting would be better. And I think a lot of them were, uh, did go to U-shaped casting, uh, which would pro provide a more stable uh, housing uh, that would not shake loose in use. And then the, the unit that contains the dies, the sockets, die sockets, um, uh, the nut and so on, that, that would be removable. And they did um, interchange these for, uh, they received a lot of uh, screws in 1795, uh, Craig Scholey had reported on this in an art article on the Russian Muhlenberg Press of 1828. And they they inter interchanged them basically for hubbing, but 1828, they went to a dedicated hubbing press because of the time it would take to remove all that, the components. The edge lettering machine, um, this was first described uh, that I found in uh, Ephraim Chambers' uh, Cyclopedia, 1728, uh, said that a single man can mark uh, 20,000 planches in a day. And they did give uh, credit to casting for inventing it. Uh, first used, he was an engineer to France, first used in um, 1685. And it was illustrated in Dobson's uh 1792 uh by robert scott and uh, either they took the design directly from this or uh henry voigt had the information he needed from the german myth that he used i think that this provided some of the some of the engineering some of the description that he used to fabricate it because this, this was done right away right from the start and i believe that was driven by david rittenhouse who wanted to have uh, good quality coinage and have edge lettering on the, the half dollars and dollars um, that would prevent alteration from clipping them. And it also gives a, a nicer edge, a raised edge, and it allows for better striking and, and a lot of different things. So this is, this is ready from the start, basically. Um, that's an example uh, of a coin that I have from the a Russ Logan uh, auction, and it, it shows a doubling. And um, I, Eric mentioned yesterday in his presentation that uh, they didn't have precision gears, and uh, no, they did not. That wouldn't come until uh, 1835, the gear hopping. And so these things were pretty loose. There was a lot of uh, slack, as they call it. Uh, if it didn't eject, they would uh, typically run it back. Right? They, they were in a rhythm, so they would uh, reverse the, the turn on it and give it another impression. And that, that second impression never matched the first because um because of the looseness in the tolerances and the and the backlash and so on um and it says in that last uh, that's a pretty good description of it i won't read the whole thing but um uh, it, it describes it a uh, reverse injuring uh, of the edges uh basically tell us that this is the way it was built and only crowns and half uh, crown pieces can bear the impression because of the thickness of their edges. Um, on gold, they used uh, reeded edges that were formed by a closed collar. Um, also, right from the start, they all had that in 1795. And and the engineering and the fabrication for that closed collar would have done been happened uh, during the uh, Rittenhouse uh, tenure, even though they were struck during uh, de Sacher, uh, during his time period. Uh, it, it, by working in tooling for 36 years, um, things take time, uh, both a design fabrication assembly, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. Steam, uh, steam was important for the Industrial Revolution. Um, they did not use it at the mint uh, until 
they lost a, a horse rolling mill in the in the fire there and replaced it with a, a steam powered rolling mill in 1816. Now I use this, uh, people have seen this before, I'm sure it's used in other uh, books and uh, it, it's useful because it shows four horses and Boudinot did say that uh, it required four horses to turn the rolling mill that turned the, uh, that reduced the ingots, large ingots down into planchet strips. Um, and then it was replaced, I think it was over $6,000 to replace it in 1816 with a steam version. And you'll notice that Voigt, or Eckfeld was a chief coiner at that time. Uh, Voigt had died in 1814. And it's interesting that Voigt had a lot of experience with steam engines, uh, steamboats. Uh, but from what he said, uh, that Rittenhouse didn't want to spend the money on uh, steam power. And uh, the screw presses were reliable, and it was a proven technology in steam. And you know, 1792 and 94 wasn't uh, yet really pr uh, perfected or proven. So they waited. And then finally, uh, 1836, um, with after Peel's pack pioneer tour to transfer the knowledge for the Europeans to Americans to allow them to use steam presses on coinage. Mm -hmm. We'll move into uh, design here. And I think the easiest to explain is uh, the reverse eagle because uh, it, it's mainly an American uh, development and uh, the American bald eagle. And the, the first one there, Armin Reason, that's Scott's first uh, attempt at an eagle in the United States. And uh, it's, frankly, it's not, it's not that good, but it was a copy of a British version uh through the site of cincinnati it, it still is not that good um james trenchard engraved this eagle and i don't think this has been shown uh in numismatic pub publications that i found uh and i think he nailed it this was this was in dobson's encyclopedia and it gives a very ac accurate representation of American eagle. And I do think the general shape of that was used uh, in the, the following eagles that Scott engraved at the mint. You could see a, a, a basic similarity in form. And that form, uh, he he got better over the years, and uh, it, he really showed his stuff, I think, in the uh, federal revenue stamps, uh, 1798. And these were used to uh, raise money for the quasi-war. Um, and it, it, these are existing dyes, and of course the image is reversed. Um, and uh, the, the detail is just uh, incredible that it gives on these. Uh, and that lit in, I think, the general shape into the $1807 shape of the eagle. Of course, uh, uh, the positioning of the arrows and all, all leaves are, are reversed there. Uh, and, and finally, his, his last, uh, master die, reverse master die in 1821 uh, for Scott. The heraldic eagle uh, was derived from the, the great seal, the basic components of it, uh, although a different form. And they went to the heraldic eagle because of the ongoing quasi war and uh, really the first Barbary War uh, was starting to be fought at that time also. And that would continue from, uh, I think, uh, Congress, they didn't declare a war, but they did authorize military action in 1797. And uh, 1805, there was a, a treaty that ended um, the first Barbary War. And so they switched the positioning of the arrows. Um, they did use a triangular shield in the New Jersey coppers. I don't know if Scott was influenced by that. It does. I do show a, a St. Andrew Society uh, engraving that does show the same shape of the shield that uh, was used on the coining. So it does show that Scott, even before the mint, had a, a preference for that shape um, of uh, the triangular shape of the shield. And heraldry, it's used for in a lot of different countries, and there's really no... Uh, it even states in the in the description that uh, the engraver has uh, some latitude there to 
uh, modify it uh, to make it to their own taste. Um, now Scott always used six pointed stars. Um, in heraldry, a uh, uh, star with straight sides is known as a mullet. And so uh, I guess in heraldry terms, um, it's a six pointed mullet that are on the stars and he preferred that shape. I, I think that it's fairly easy to make a punch and uh, oh, once uh, the punches are done, he could arrange them into a uh, intricate pattern if he needed to. Uh, you've got these two um, and he would need a, uh, I, in my tooling experience of blowing, every every hole that's drilled in an airplane is uh, drilled with a use of a, a drill jig. It locates accurately the holes that are drilled. I think he used something similar to locate uh, these stars on these two because they are so accurately placed. And I've, I've been some punching and it's not easy to do. Uh, but you have to control the, the X, Y axis and all the rotation, also the rotation of the stars. Um, and I think he did that in a, in a number of different areas that have been engraving. He would have some, uh, some tooling that would allow them, allow him to more accurately place the, the devices. Uh, they used castle on typeface, uh, and that was throughout the, uh, American revolution. Um, there is an early use of the revenue, of the heraldic eagle for the revenue stamp. And same as the previous slide, it's used to raise money, which it was very success, successful in doing uh, for the Quasi War and First Barbary War. Um, there's a, a gold example, the heraldic eagle, and a, uh, it's my example of uh, the silver air with a couple of big cuds, uh, which uh, were ended in 1807 with a Thrust from state, uh, shape of the dies. Um, there's a, a it's still used a variation currently for the uh, Kennedy half dollar reverse. Although I think uh, that's a proof seventy coin and, and the shield lines, the eagle's head, they just aren't as sharp as Scott did when he got a coin that was well struck like the gold one. It was really uh, really well done, I think. So we'll move on to the obverse. So classical design, neoclassical design was greatly influenced from, by Johann Winkelmann's 1764 book. Uh, and that was a, he is a German art historian uh, and he's considered basically to be the founder of the neoclassical movement, and some consider him also to be a, uh, the father of uh, art history. Um, that book was translated almost immediately when it was published, and it spread very rapidly throughout Europe. Um, it spread to the Britannica, uh, which was reprinted in America. Um, and he's the first person to not only break down the, the Grecian sculpture into time segments, but he also breaks down the proportions uh, in very uh, minute detail, the eyes, even the size of the pupil, the eye, uh, the distances between the lips and the chin, uh, and so on. And he defines the, the uh, classical uh, the Grecian profile. I've always wondered why uh, uh, Cornelius Vermeul, uh, and I think most of people here are familiar with his book on aesthetics of American coinage. Um, he called uh, everything from the first meant neoclassical and Greco-Roman. And I always wondered what criteria he used to determine that. Is there any physical criteria? Well, it's basically, it was developed by Winkleman. And it spread through the art schools, spread through the encyclopedias, and to the United States. And those are three illustrations there uh, that I've selected from Robert Scott's engraving right before he came to the Mint in 1792. And it does give reference lines uh, on, on how to uh, engrave and construct these uh, drawings and engravings. Uh, Scott himself was educated in Greek sculpture, and he created plaster models in 1765 in Edinburgh on Nidri Street. 
Uh, he was in a, a partnership there. Um, and he also illustrated the, the Greek sculpture and drawing structure in four Dobsons uh, immediately before the mint. Proportion is essential in classical design. And I'll read a, a comment here. Proportion is the basis of beauty, and there could be no beauty without it. Um, in the drapery, uh, there's about 13 different guidelines or elements that are described. Again, those are uh, translated and uh, from Winkleman's book, and Scott used them on the on the designs of, on the great buffs. So those are classical draperies. Uh, the great bust coinage was designed and engraved by Robert Scott. Uh, wax models, as we now know, uh, were provided by John Eckstein for the silver drape bust, which. Uh, I think provided the the finishing detail on it, uh, provided some of the three dimensional uh, attributes that are on that design, and also uh, the expression of tranquility was frequent in Grecian statue, and I believe that's the expression they use in, in coinage, kind of a neutral uh, expression. Uh, proportions uh, again, Robert Scott was was very accurate in in his engraving and uh, consistent also uh, the proportions he didn't have a reducing lathe and uh, there's several methods that he could have used in a follow-up article i'll uh, choose the one i think he uh, probably preferred um, to reduce these uh, you could reduce uh, uh, the silver five different denominations overlay them and they look basically about the same, only very small variation with uh, which e each uh, denomination. Um, Grecian profile, um, the more on proportions. Um, again, this uh, margin is being cut off here. Uh, the Grecian uh, profiles were defined by Winkleman in his book, and uh, again, it was translated into English and uh, sent to America via Dobson's. Um, one of the important things, uh, they did use, um, according to Winkleman, fixed rules and uh, fixed rules on dimensions of the proportions because they were so consistent. Uh, and he does state that um, when he describes the face, that uh, the faces consist of three parts and uh, three times the length of the nose, uh, but the head is not four times the length of the nose as some writers have asserted. So basically what he's saying is, we'll take this profile that Scott engraved uh, to develop a Grecian uh, profile uh, as a start for an engraving or a drawing, uh, the nose is is longer than your average nose. And it also has a higher bridge, um, uh, more distance from the eyes. So it almost gives a straight line from the tip of the nose to the forehead, not quite, uh, but that is a classic Grecian profile. And and that's how uh, Vermeule, I think, identified it as throughout the first mint as Grecian profiles. Um, they also use the same proportions in men and women. There's there's uh, differences, small differences in the facial, uh, in the lips and eyes that are described by Winkleman uh, that I think are reproduced in, in the coinage by Scott. Um, Vermeule is uh, describing the 1816 cent redesign, and he's very careful in his wording there, basic forms of a Greco-Roman uh, Juno or Venus. So he's not saying that that's Venus. Uh, it just has the basic form. I, I don't think he knew that Robert Scott uh, engraved Venus in 1792 prior to the mint. And it, it does show a very um, basic form that's similar to the, that scent. And uh, one thing I will note on the where the hair is tied back uh, Winkleman says there, there is two chords uh, for important figures always use two chords in tying it back and there's one chord intertwined so uh, exactly as he described it it shows up on the coinage 
and I'll be a little bit more uh, uh, detailed on that in, in my follow-up article on this. Um, going to the, the cap bust, um, that is a classic Grecian uh, profile. And a lot of people have said, well, it looks like this person, that person. Well, it, it, it looks more, I think, like a, a Grecian uh, profile. And it does have the longer nose, the higher bridge. Um, in his book, uh, Winkleman says that uh, drawings and engravings are, are constructed. You start first with uh, a profile that's shown here. And, and there's quite a bit of similarity between this profile and then add the features that you want. And in this case, there there's some similarity in the drapery of, of Apollo to uh, Miss Liberty. I'm not saying that it's Apollo, just like um, uh, Vermeule. It's a basic form of the drapery. And also the ornaments were described. Um, and it does show a ornament that's a smaller ornament and uh, the larger one is used for Apollo and uh, as well as a hairband so uh, according to Winkleman and I, I think that's a Scott way Scott developed his engravings was to start with a profile that he wants which in all cases was a, a Grecian profile add the elements of design that he wanted and and you get a uh, something that is a basic form neoclassical form that was used on early mint coinage um this is one of the methods that he used for reduction uh and i was taught this in technical drawing in 1975 um this uses uh, perspective and you could recreate a smaller circle or smaller coin and kind of uh, essentially just connect the dots um it, it's actually a, a very simple method and it doesn't require any tools uh there's other uh, two other methods that he could have used i think he probably chose that one um to re accurately reduce the drawings because he didn't have a reducing length um this is uh i put this in here and i i reverse the image because uh robert scott reversed the image but that is apollo belvedere and that was considered to be through the enlightenment um the most perfect form and uh, a very famous uh sculpture uh scott did uh recreate it sorry Uh, recreate it uh, as an engraving in his uh, drawing illustrations, along with the other uh, classical figures. And um, that's it, all in Dobson's, and there's not too many sets that exist anymore. I, I am fortunate to have a set. Yeah, it leads into the summary here. Um, Life publications disseminated knowledge and enabled the transformation of material culture, industry, economics, and political ideologies. Industrial revolution innovation was leveraged and accelerated through uh, Enlightenment publications, fostering a rapid development of the United States Mint technology and under the direction of David Rittenhouse and the supervision of uh, Henry Voigt and the subsequent minting of world-class coinage. Uh, Robert Scott was a primary engraver for the first encyclopedia published in America uh, with illustrations for coining and classical design, and he later infused classical-inspired uh, coin, coinage as chief engraver of the United States Mint, creating iconic coinages shaped by political turmoil and forming an authoritative expression of national identity. And I will open up to questions at this time and comments. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, if we have any questions in the house or online, be more than happy to take them now. I have the microphone in hand. 
Uh, Bill, one other thing I'd like to say is uh, a comment from myself is I find it really intriguing how mints of this period and before and even a little bit after are often considered to be uh, the ground zero, the starting point of a lot of enlightenment thinking and technological advancement. But these places didn't necessarily, they didn't uh, exist in a vacuum and they themselves had to learn from somewhere. So it's really intriguing to see you know, the, the primary source material that, that these places were actually using. So thank you for that. Yeah, and a lot of those uh, sources are now uh, lost in time. There's very few sets of uh, Dobson's encyclopedia uh, left anymore, and it, it hasn't really been mentioned in uh, previous uh, numismatic uh, publications, at least in detail. And it does, uh, as I mentioned, it does contain everything you need uh, to create a mint and also to create classical uh, engravings if you had skilled people to do that, That's which you did. Any questions? I think that that may have been a, a perfect presentation. Oh, we have a couple questions uh, online. Um, the ANS has an unpublished manuscript, quote, an essay, an uh, essay on coining by Samuel Thompson, Die Sinker, 1783, a quote unquote, how to manual manual with numerous illustrations, uh, seems to have had little influence. An exact transcription was made by Randy Clark uh, and others and published by C4 in 2002. Uh, I don't know if you've come across that. I think that was more of a, a comment uh, or suggestion to see. Uh, that is uh, extremely interesting. No, I have not. Um, it'd be great if that, uh, if an article or something could be published on that. When can we get that digitized today, please? Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and uh, there was question. instruction going around, you know, so it, it wasn't all uh, person to person. It, it was through uh, El, uh, Enlightenment publications. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, we had another question online. Uh, an unrealized goal of Jim Spillman's uh, Colonial Newsletter Foundation was to establish a replica of a colonial era mint. Jim published a series of articles on 17th, I'm sorry, on 18th in, uh, century minting technology. So there's a little bit more. Uh, material out there from from other uh, researchers. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you come across that as well. Okay, I will have to look that up. All right. Any other comments or questions in house online? All right. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> oh, we do have one. One. Sorry. Uh, one more, and then another round of applause. Uh, Eric Krauss, uh, on the uh, Grecian profile slide, two of the types illustrated represent the work of John Reich, not Robert Scott. In what ways do you see Reich's individual contribution to the devices used on circulating coinage? Well, that has been uh, debated. And uh, first of all, uh, Robert Scott was the chief engraver, and it is in Mint records that he gave Reich direction. Reich was to take direction from two people, uh, Scott and Director Patterson. So everything that was engraved by Reich was directed by Scott. And I, I do believe that uh, the neoclassical designs came from Scott. Is to what is being and what was engraved uh, that is still being researched. And uh, if you've read those articles uh, by Mr. Ross in the John Reich Journal, what was thought to be um, Reich's signature was actually punched by Scott. Mm -hmm. So in this presentation, I didn't say that Scott engraved that design or Reich engraved it because it's it's still up for debate. Uh, but the facts are that. Scott was a chief engraver. He directed Reich's work. Um, I th personally think that Reich cut the, the eagle master die, and I think he probably cut the master die uh, for the, the cap bus app. There's, there's nothing in documentation to admit that uh, states that. And I, I use stylistic uh, cues now, a little bit higher relief, uh, coarser hair, and so on. But I believe the design was directed by Scott. Interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, another uh, comment. Uh, great talk. Mid 19th century uh, Columbia Pesios uh, has had edge lettering imposed after striking, causing uh, bilging of the fashion 
the fusion uh, design, sorry. Uh, strange, why did they do that? Um, uh, you, could you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, great talk. Mid century 19th Colombian pesos had edge lettering imposed after striking, uh, okay. causing the design to distort a little bit. Do you know why they may have done that? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, any other questions online? In house? Yes, uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for that presentation. That was great. Um, going back to Dobson's encyclopedia, uh, where it showed the edge lettering, the drawing of the patent, is there a, a different view of that where you can actually see it more close up and see the, the mechanism that's actually making an impression on the edges? So that is the only illustration that is in Dobson's. Uh, with it uh, comes that fairly good pre, uh, description of it, uh, but that's all they get, and it's it, it's not that deal detailed. But I think a ingenious person like Henry Voigt could take that and design something and fabricate it uh, to match. And he, he did work in Germany in a mint, and uh, he did have experience with that type of equipment. Um, I know the a &E has one, um, but it's it's constructed off of uh, off the shelf gearing, which he didn't have. So it's, it's kind of a notional example that shows how it works, uh, but it's not as crude as they had back at the early mint. Right. Yeah, it seemed like some of the other illustrations in those patents were really um, amazing, like almost photographic, where you could see and and actually, like yesterday's presentation, Mr. Eric had actually had people build his his rocking and roller press from drawings. So mm -hmm. it just goes to show you that you could really learn a lot from the, the illustrated encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very similar to what Eric had done uh, with his. I mean, he was essentially looking at, you know, photographs of uh, pieces that still exist in Europe and then experimenting with it. And I'm sure that they're doing the same thing, just looking at photographs and or engravings as, as the case may be, and just experimenting with, with their own machines. They're intriguing. Uh, any other questions, uh, comments? Thank you I, for that. I, I just like to add that I think uh, uh, thanks to uh, People like Walter Breen and, and Don Taxay, Robert Scott has been vilified. He's been thought of as not a good engraver. And I think Bill Nyberg has, has proved otherwise. Um, this is wonderful research and, and uh, congratulations. I'm looking forward to seeing the paper. Thank you, Bill. Very good. So one question here. Please, yes. Um, what was Scott's role in die sinking? Um, good question, because it's not uh, accurately defined in Mint records. He did write a four-page letter to uh, Congress in 1795 uh, stating what he did, what his role was. And uh, his primary role was creating the, the master die uh, and the hub, which is essentially the design for the coinage. And at that po point in time, he didn't have a lot of assistance, so he did everything. He went through the whole process of uh, describing the master die, the hub, raising the hub, sinking the working die, uh, finishing the working die. Um, and that's really uh, entails it. He said the problems that they were having at that time were the heat treating of the dyes, um, which caused them to fail fairly quickly. And Adam Eckfeldt really came up to very quickly and created um, a different method of heat treating using uh, spray, uh, uh, spray quenching that uh, extended the life of the dyes. Uh, but it, his main description was the usual process of engraving dies through the, the master die, the uh, raising the hub, finishing the working die, and he gave uh, the length of time to do that. Of course, the master die would take the longest from between five and eight days 
uh, depending on the size and raising the hub and finish the working dies were one to two day each. I wish he gave more detail, but uh, that would uh, explain a lot of the stuff that we debate. But that that's all we get uh, in in his 30 years there. You get a four page document of what he did. Yeah.